Let's set the scene. It's the early 9th century. You're a coastal villager in Francia. The sky is clear, the ocean calm. Then, from beyond the horizon, a sleek shape appears. It's long, low, and fast. No port, no warning. Just a swift, silent arrival. That's not a merchant ship. That's a Viking longship. And by the time you hear it, it's already too late. So what made this ship so terrifying and so effective? To understand that, let's compare it to what the rest of Europe was sailing at the time. While the Norse were slicing through the sea in lightweight, flexible longships, most European sailors were stuck with vessels like the early cog or round ships. These were heavy, bulky boats with high sides, square hulls, and a single large sail. Built for cargo, not speed. Cogs could barely do two to four knots, and good luck steering one up a river or onto a beach. Turning? Forget it. Quick escape? Not happening. Meanwhile, the longship? A low profile for stealth. Symmetrical ends for quick reversal, and most importantly, a shallow draft. That meant it could sail in rivers as shallow as three feet deep. The Viking crew didn't need a harbor. They could pull up anywhere, raid and leave before soldiers could even get their boots on. Now let's talk maneuverability. Where European ships relied on deep keels and tall hulls that caught the wind and waves, longships hugged the water with a flexible, clinker-built hull that bent with the sea. That gave them unmatched stability and control, even in rough weather. Plus, they had both sails and oars. That meant wind power when it was in their favor, and manpower when it wasn't. If a storm kicked up or the wind died, Vikings didn't wait around. They rode to safety. Cogs? They drifted. Or sank. It's like comparing a sports car to a delivery truck. One was built for conquest, the other for hauling grain. But the longship wasn't just faster and more agile, it was strategic. Every plank, every nail had a purpose. It was designed to take the Vikings anywhere they wanted to go. Whether that was a riverside monastery, a trade port in Constantinople, or even the wild shores of North America. And all of that, that's just scratching the surface. Now let's look closer at how Viking builders made it possible, starting with one of the cleverest construction techniques of the medieval world. While most of Europe was still building boats like they were barn walls, flat, stiff, and nailed edge to edge, the Vikings had already unlocked one of the most effective maritime innovations of the medieval world, clinker building. Here's how it worked. Instead of laying planks flush, the Norse overlapped them like shingles on a roof. These curved, overlapping planks, called strakes, were fastened together with iron rivets and rosin-soaked fibers, creating a hull that wasn't just strong. It was flexible. That's right. The longship's hull could bend and twist with the waves rather than resisting them like the stiff-sided European ships. In a rough sea that gave longships an edge in durability and maneuverability, it was almost like the ship was breathing with the ocean. Meanwhile, European shipwrights were stuck with a method called carvel building, where planks were laid edge to edge, sealed with pitch, and then reinforced with heavy beams. Strong, sure, but light and agile? Not even close. The clinker method made Viking longships lighter too. A 75-foot longship could weigh as little as 10 tons, less than half the weight of a similarly sized European vessel. And here's the kicker. That lighter frame didn't come at the cost of strength. The overlapping hull absorbed impact, especially when crashing against rocks or getting hauled overland. Yes, hauled overland. We'll get to that soon. Even the tools used by Norse builders were specialized. Broad axes for shaping curved planks, iron rivets forged in village smithies and pine tar to waterproof the seams. These weren't mass-produced boats. Each one was a handcrafted, seagoing weapon. The result? A ship that could survive the open ocean, sprint upriver and strike like lightning, then vanish. So while other ships lumbered along coastlines, the longship flew. Okay, time to talk about one of the longship's sneakiest secrets. Forget heavy armor or catapults. This was the real game changer. The shallow draft. What's that? It's how deep the bottom of the ship goes into the water. Viking longships barely dipped below the surface. We're talking two to three feet of water, that's it. Now, compare that to a typical medieval cog, the standard ship used by European merchants. Cogs had big, deep keels. They needed deeper water, proper harbors, and plenty of time to dock. And turning one? That was like steering a cow on ice. Long ships? They didn't care about ports. They could sail right up the beach. No dock? No problem. 
Just slide in, hop off, swing your axe, and be back at sea before the villagers even knew what hit them. This gave the Vikings a tactical superpower. They could attack from anywhere. They could strike deep inland by rowing up rivers. And when things got too hot, they didn't retreat. They just reversed out the way they came. Now imagine being a monk in Lindisfarne or a noble in Paris thinking, oh, the ocean is far away. We're safe. Nope. The longships made rivers into their own personal Viking highways. In 845, Norse raiders sailed up the Seine, straight into Paris. Not just once, repeatedly. The king had to pay them a ransom in silver just to get them to leave. Meanwhile, European ships were limited to coastlines and deep harbors. Try hauling a medieval cog upriver? You'd need a miracle, or a century. And the benefits didn't stop at raiding. The shallow draft also helped explorers like Leif Erikson and traders on the Russian rivers reach places no European merchant could. From Iceland to Constantinople, the longship's shallow hull opened the world to Norse feet. So next time you see a Viking longship, don't just think boat. Think amphibious assault vehicle, river racer, escape pod, and a one-way ticket to your village's worst day. Now we move beneath the surface, literally. At the heart of every Viking longship was a single unbroken length of oak, thick, strong, and shaped like a spine. This wasn't just any piece of wood. This was the keel, the backbone of the longship, and one of its greatest secrets. In shipbuilding, the keel does two things. It holds the hull together, and it keeps the ship tracking straight in the water. Think of it like the center line on a highway. Without it, you're drifting all over the place. But here's where the Viking keel gets clever. It was shallow enough to keep the longship agile in rivers, yet long and sturdy enough to keep it stable in open seas. That's not an easy balance to pull off. Most European ships of the time either didn't have a proper keel at all, or only had deep, bulky ones that limited where they could go. Take a cog, for example. Its keel was thick and heavy, fine for sailing straight through coastal trade routes. But try to maneuver that thing upriver or through narrow fjords. Forget it, you'd end up sideways, or sunk. Now here's a fun twist. Because of the longship's symmetrical design with identical bow and stern, you didn't need to turn the ship around. Just switch direction. Literally row the other way, and you're gone. Quick getaway? Check. River ambush? Check. Complete 180 in a flash? Double check. The keel also helped stiffen the hull, adding strength without adding too much weight. Combined with the flexible clinker planking, the ship could ride the waves instead of fighting them. The result? A ship that was nimble on rivers, stable on oceans, and deadly on arrival. So, while medieval Europe was chugging along in sluggish, square-bottomed tubs, the Vikings were riding warhorses made of oak, iron, and wind. So far, we've talked about rowing, and yeah, Vikings were absolute beasts at it. But let's be honest, rowing across the North Atlantic? That's a hard pass. Even the toughest Norsemen needed a break. That's where the sail came in. Every longship was equipped with a single square sail, woven from thick wool and often dyed with bold stripes. Reds, yellows, blacks. Not just for style, though, that helped. These colors may have signaled which clan the ship belonged to, or simply intimidated whoever was about to get raided. Now, this sail wasn't mounted dead center. It was set slightly forward on the ship's long, low frame. Why? Because the weight balance was everything. You had to catch the wind without tipping the boat, or getting spun in circles like a cork. And when that wind was blowing just right, the longship could soar. We're talking up to 10 knots, nearly 12 miles an hour. That's about as fast as a modern rowing team today, but without all the screaming coaches and lycra suits. Meanwhile, what did the rest of Europe have? Sails, sure. But on bulky, high-walled ships like the Cog, the wind was more of a suggestion than a power source. European sails were larger, higher, and harder to manage with a small crew. They were good for catching a breeze in the open sea, but if you needed to maneuver quickly or stop on a dime, good luck. Now, let's talk steering. While most European ships had a central rudder in the back, Vikings used something smarter, a side-mounted steering oar attached to the right side of the ship. And it wasn't just a paddle. This was a large, carved oar, lashed to the hull with adjustable ropes. It let the helmsman control the ship with incredible finesse, whether cruising through fjords, turning up river, or dodging sea rocks during a storm. You couldn't beat it for agility. So, let's recap. A powerful sail to ride the wind, a lightweight frame that didn't drag, 
and a steering system so advanced it literally changed the English language. While other ships depended on good weather and deep harbors, Viking longships could sail anywhere, steer anywhere, and land anywhere. All right, we've seen Viking longships sail through oceans, glide up rivers, and outrun enemies. But how about this? They could also... walk. Okay, not literally, but close. Because of their lightweight, flexible design, Viking longships could be hauled overland by the very warriors who sailed them. If a river became too narrow, or if they needed to jump from one waterway to another, no problem. The crew would carry the ship. Imagine that. A 70-foot warship picked up and moved like a wheelbarrow by a team of tired, mud-covered raiders. You won't see that with a medieval cog. Those beasts weighed three times as much and needed cranes just to load cargo. But the Norse didn't see terrain as a limitation. They saw it as a shortcut. In fact, on some of the great trade routes through Eastern Europe, especially in what's now Russia and Ukraine, Viking traders known as the Varangians would literally portage their ships overland to reach new river systems and trading posts. They didn't wait for engineers to build canals or bridges. They grabbed some logs, greased the runners, and pulled the ship over hills, marshes, even forests. This made Viking ships the Swiss army knives of the medieval world. Capable of attacking a monastery in the morning, floating down a river by noon, and getting dragged across land by dinner time. Meanwhile, European ships were parked like oversized donkeys, waiting for the tide, a port, or divine intervention. And that's the key difference. The Viking longship wasn't bound by the sea, it was a mobile weapon. It turned the entire landscape into a battlefield. No safe ports, no off-limit zones. If there was water, or a way to get to water, they'd find it. So next time you hear a river flowing or see a foggy fjord, just imagine that long silhouette rising out of the mist. Because with the longship, nowhere was safe. But what are we really looking at when we see a Viking longship? It's more than wood, sail, and steel. It's a floating symbol of innovation, of fearless ambition, and of a people who reshaped the map of the medieval world. From the frozen fjords of Norway to the green shores of Ireland, from the icy rivers of Russia to the rugged coast of North America, the Viking longship carved a legacy with every ripple it left behind. And here's the wild part. It barely changed in over 300 years. Because it didn't need to. The design was so effective so far ahead of its time that no one improved on it for centuries. Fast, lightweight, durable, amphibious. It was a perfect storm of simplicity and genius. While European ships were evolving slowly, locked to coasts, limited by ports, weighed down by bulk, the Norse were already sailing across oceans and back. Not by accident, not by chance, by design. And it wasn't just for war. Long ships brought settlers to Iceland, merchants to Baghdad, Explorers to Vinland, 500 years before Columbus even set sail. Even today, modern naval architects still admire the symmetry, the strength, the elegance of the Viking hull. Museums worldwide showcase these vessels not just as artifacts, but as works of maritime art. The Viking longship didn't just conquer lands, it conquered time. Whenever you hear the crack of wind in canvas or the splash of oars in water, think of them. The warriors, the builders the raiders and dreamers, who turned wood and willpower into one of the most advanced machines of the medieval world. If you enjoyed this voyage through Viking innovation, make sure to like the video, subscribe for more epic Norse history, and hit that bell so you never miss another raid through time.